Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true and downright strange encounters with unexplained creatures that'll freak you out tonight. Now, it doesn't matter whether you're walking through a city park or you're deep in the woods somewhere in the mountains where you haven't seen another living being for many miles. These cryptid creatures seem to show up at all hours of the day anywhere they want. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story here with everyone in the swamp. If you're new, be sure to elbow that like button, subscribe if you're new, and turn on notifications. I upload multiple videos every single week, and get ready for these creepy and allegedly true cryptid encounters that'll freak you out tonight. My Encounter with the Hide Behind by Anonymous My encounter takes place in Kansas City. I was 19 years old when I happened to encounter something spooky. Sometimes I still can't believe that I even saw anything at all. I live in a small neighborhood with my family. In this small town, where nothing of importance or anything exciting really ever happens, I witnessed something possibly supernatural. I grew up reading about cryptids and monsters and listening to alleged encounters with such entities, but until now, I had never actually seen anything. I still love hearing stories about Wendigo and Dogmen wishing to encounter one. I've always wanted to be the one who saw something. Even if their encounters were dangerous, I wouldn't hesitate to look for one. But I guess I just never got the chance. One evening after work, I was drawing in my bedroom on a freezing night. I usually spend my evenings after work texting my friends and drawing fantasy creatures on my phone to pass the time. At one point, later in the evening, I was reminded by my mom that I needed to take the trash down to the end of the driveway for the garbage truck to pick up the following day. It was a freezing autumn night, and I didn't want to go outside and freeze my ass off, so I waited until I was about to go to bed to take the trash down. We have five trash cans that we leave out for the garbage truck, since it's a very big family. I put my jacket on and head downstairs. It's around 11.30pm at this point and no one else is awake except for me and my dog, Scout. Scout has two dog beds, one in the dining room and one by the front door. When I walk downstairs, Scout has her muzzle pressed against the window and is focused on something outside. At the time, I thought it was a raccoon. There was one that lived in the tree on our front lawn. But now that I'm thinking about this encounter, I don't believe that Scout was watching a raccoon. I think nothing about what she might be watching outside and I head right on out. I walk over in front of the garage doors, grabbing each trash can individually and taking them down to the end of the driveway. I'm putting trash can number three down at the end when I hear what I can only describe as a scrabbling noise. It sounds like something is climbing down a tree. Depending on the animal, you can often tell how big it is by the sound when it rises or walks. It didn't sound like a small animal. It sounded rather big, like bare skin on the bark. I turn and see a figure peeking out behind a tree. It's about as tall as me, but the cover of night makes it hard to distinguish this person's facial features or skin color. From the outline that I could see of this person, they were deadly skinny and seemed to be malnourished. I used to be so gullible and tended to make new friends, even with people who didn't like me. It was this gullible friendliness, however, that tipped me off that something was off about this individual. I assumed it was just a homeless person or maybe, uh, maybe one of my neighbors. Hey, sir, ma'am, what are you doing out at this hour? I asked politely. The individual in question did not move from their spot, but I could see their breath forming little clouds in the air from the coal. Their left arm was wrapped around the side of the tree trunk facing me, but I could barely make out the outline of its bony arm in the near pitch black of the night. I turned away momentarily and pushed trash can number three next to the other two, and when I turned around, the figure was gone. I was baffled. I had only turned around for a split second and it had disappeared without a sound. I went over and inspected the tree where it had just been standing. 
The ground had been disturbed where it had stood, and there was a faint mark on the tree from where the person had wrapped its arm. I looked up at the tree and even pointed my phone light up at it. I finished taking the trash cans down quickly because it was freezing out there, and whatever unidentified person was standing in my front yard only a few seconds ago was gone. To this day, I, I think I saw one of three different cryptids. I think it was either a rake, a skimwalker, wendigo, or maybe like a hide behind. For those who do not know, a hide behind is an old cryptid that was allegedly seen by loggers in America's early history. Supposedly, a monster hid behind trees and used the trees as cover to hunt for its prey. Humans. Supposedly, people did die to attacks from hide behinds back in the day, but nothing has ever been verified. Descriptions of the hide behind vary from being a large reptilian to a big black furry beast. To this day, I haven't seen it since, and I kind of want to see it again, even if my initial experience was very creepy. Not a dog by Colden. Hey Swamp Dweller, I noticed you shared my story in the past, so I wanted to share another experience I had about four years ago. I went to a park with my friend. We would often go here and bike down the trails they had. They were quite calming, but all of that changed when we returned to the park. We saw a lot of animals and some kids. One of these animals though, it looked off. We think it was a dog, but we still don't really know to this day. The dog, or creature, had black fur and extraordinarily long and sharp claws. It jumped on a raccoon and killed it right in front of us. We watched it in disgust as it started to eat the raccoon raw. Then it turned and looked at us, and we got a good look at whatever this thing was. It had big red beady eyes. It started to chase after us for just a second. We dashed away and we got into a yard. I had a pocket knife and I thought that maybe this would protect us if we happened to fall to the ground. But now looking back on it, it definitely wouldn't have done anything. We ended up tripping and scratching our knees up a little bit but overall we were okay. When we got back home, I grabbed my hunting rifle and sat against the door the whole night. I refused to return to that park alone and definitely not after sundown. Many people believe what they perceive in the world is reality. Everything they see, touch, smell, and hear is real, and will always be real. This always goes for things that they don't believe in. We live in a world where they no longer fear the monsters in the dark, believing we have discovered all the apex predators of the world, such as the sharks, the orcas, the bears, the wolves, and large cats, and we believe we are on the top of the food chain. While it is true, we currently have no natural predators, we are merely prey of opportunity. This doesn't change the fact that we are prey nonetheless. One doesn't get to experience the feeling of being hunted, of being stalked like a wolf stalks an elk. The feeling of dread you feel as the eyes of a predator are staring into you, waiting for you to make one wrong move. I was 14 at the time. I had short black hair and braces that made me look like the biggest dork you have ever met in your life. Funny enough, I was. While I played lacrosse and was semi-athletic, what I lacked in coordination and speed I made up for with a deceiving amount of brute strength, an amount that didn't make sense for my small stature. I was in Phoenix, Arizona for my annual summer trip to visit my grandparents on my father's side of the family. My grandparents seemed like opposites. My grandfather is a tall, semi-muscular man, standing at 6 feet 6 inches in height and weighing easily over 190 pounds, who never seemed to take anything seriously and loved to crack joke and tease others. My grandmother was tall for a woman, standing at easily 5 feet 9 inches, was rather skinny. She didn't make jokes often, but always seemed to laugh at my grandfather's jokes. The only similarities I ever felt like they really shared was their love for their family and their love for going on walks and hiking. They also owned a beautiful dog named Lucy. Lucy was a rescue when my grandparents got her, and such, she came with her own issues. She wasn't fond of bigger men and hated big dogs. 
yet somehow that didn't seem to stop her from loving any of the men in my family, including my grandfather. If you saw Lucy from a distance, you'd think it was just a large fox. Her fur was the orange color foxes have, and her tail looked just like a fox. In truth, no one knew what breed she was. Even after having become a registered veterinarian assistant, I still have no good guess. The only thing I know for sure is that she at least shares some part of German Shepherd, as she shares the same common characteristics they have, including the medium size, pointy ears, snout, and her love and undying devotion to her owners. The morning after I arrived at my grandmother's, they told me that they were going to hike up Camelback Mountain, a mountain that got its name for looking like a camel's hump. I hated the idea of doing this. Like most high schoolers, I just wanted to lay in bed and watch YouTube, especially since this would be the first year I didn't have my brother Jalen to keep me company. Jalen was my older brother, who had six years on me. He had just turned 20 and decided he needed to work to save up money for when he goes back to campus, leaving me to go on a trip by himself. I wasn't upset. Obviously, this is a decision he needed to make, but I was sad about it. Up until eighth grade, he had been my only real friend that I could really rely on and open up to. As I was sitting in the car with my grandmother, I remember staring out the window, admiring the scorching sun, and listening to the steady panting of Lucy in the back. I looked up into the rearview mirror in hopes of seeing her smiling face and instilling confidence in me. I yawned and rolled onto my side, facing the passenger side of the car and closed my eyes. While I slept, I remember reflecting on the story my grandfather on my mother's side of the family told me a few months ago. These grandparents only lived a few hours south of my family, so I visited them more often. My grandfather, who I will refer to as Papa to help separate the two, is a short, overweight man who loved his grandchildren more than life itself, but he took a liking to me more than anyone else. I think the reason for this was because I took the time to listen to his story. Papa had served in Vietnam when he was younger and had numerous stories to tell, a few of which were almost unsettling. He told me of creatures, the likes of which we humans have never seen before, living in the jungles there. He told me how the creature was more dangerous than the Viet Cong soldier or animal or anything like that. He also gave me survival tips in case I ever found myself stuck in the woods and felt unsafe. If you ever feel like you're being stalked by something, do not run. Pray runs. His voice echoed in my head. Don't ever scream. Pray screams. If you see the creature stalking you, do not meet its gaze. Most animals take that as you challenging it, and while humans are extremely capable creatures, being able to rely on adrenaline to take down a lot of animals, there are creatures in this world that will butcher us without hesitating. His words seemed to burn themselves into my head. All you need to do is make yourself look as big as possible and walk out of its territory as fast as possible while still walking. The last of his words echoed as I felt someone shaking my body a little bit. We're here, Josh. It's time to wake up. I heard my grandmother say while rocking my body back and forth. We both got out of the car, and I gave Lucy the treats I had promised her. As I stood outside the car holding Lucy's leash, I breathed in the fresh air. It smelled quite different from Indiana, as it didn't carry the swamp smell Indiana's humidity usually carries with it. The air was much thinner making me more confident that I wouldn't be able to run nearly as far as I would be able to at home. As we walked along the trail, my grandmother and I side by side with Lucy leading the way ahead of us, I made idle talk with her as we walked down the trail. The mountains were beautiful, while well, one would imagine it just to be a barren desert there. There are specific parts of arid trees and cacti that turn into a sort of forest, that combined with the beautiful blue skies and warm, almost boiling hot weather, made it a beautiful day to hike. As we continued to walk, I felt this sense of dread growing inside of me. The further we went, I looked down to Lucy, whose ears were now up and alert. Her body was low to the ground. She sensed something near us. I began to feel uneasy. The mountains of Arizona had many creatures inhabiting it, which include black bear, mountain lions, elk, deer, javelina, coyote, antelope, along with a lot more. I looked at my grandmother who didn't seem bothered at all. This feeling of dread grew bigger and bigger, the weight of it sitting on my chest. Something was staring at me. I could feel it piercing my soul. I recalled my papa's advice and attempted to make myself look as big as possible. 
which admittedly wasn't very big at all. My goal was to make myself seem like I just wasn't worth the trouble. I looked around trying to spot anything out of place when I saw it. Peering around from behind a cactus was some sort of creature covered in black fur. I couldn't see its body because it was behind the giant cactus, but I could tell it was easily as tall as this cactus was. This thing was easily seven feet tall. I tried to avoid its gaze, not wanting to accidentally challenge it, but it felt as though my eyes snapped to them on their own. Its eyes were black. Not black, but more like they were completely void of light, except for a small amount of yellow. Their eyes were beady and honestly soulless. The longer I looked, I noticed this giant hand reaching around the front of the cactus. Its hands was big enough to fit my head inside of it, and it had two-inch claws at its fingertips. My head snapped away from it, and I looked ahead. Grandma, we need to turn around and leave. I said trying not to show fear, but wanting to get the urgency across. Oh, but we haven't made it halfway yet. My grandmother said with the sound of sadness in her voice. I needed to come up with something to get us out of there. I looked down to Lucy, who was still walking forward, but her head wasn't looking ahead. She was looking at my right. The direction I saw the monster watching us from. Grandma, I don't feel good. My stomach hurts and I feel nauseous. Can we please just go back? I promise we can take Lucy on a walk a little bit later. I said, trying to sound as sick as possible. I guess that is fine, my grandmother said almost disappointingly, and she really wanted to take me to the peak this year. When we turned around, I made sure to keep myself between where I had seen the monster and my grandmother. As we walked back down, feeling the dread continued to get worse. This feeling of hopelessness that you are no longer the scariest out there anymore. That at any moment's notice, something could decide to take you out of this world. When we got back to the car, I noticed we were still the only ones out there. Which is strange, as it was usually a place to go hiking that was very popular. Lucy reluctantly got back into the SUV, preferring to stay outside and keep watch while my grandmother got in the car. While I finally got Lucy in, and I got myself in, I looked ahead on the trail. There was something, somewhat obscured by the foliage. It was a hulking animal of some sort. It had the face of a dog with its long black snout, but was easily bigger than any black bear I'd ever seen before. It stared at me, into my soul once again but it never moved, only stared at me, which was almost scarier than it charging us. We went back home where I sat in my room and immediately called my papa. Honestly, he would be the only one that would believe me. Two days later, my grandmother told me she had seen something weird on the news of a few hikers going missing on that very same trail. She thanked me for convincing us to leave. I still have never, ever gone back to those mountains. Even as I've gotten bigger and more experienced hunting and such, I just don't trust it. I now carry a serrated pocket knife that my papa had given me for my 15th birthday everywhere I go. I will never forget the advice he had given me. The Michigan Gator Man? By Certified Burger. Now before I begin this story, let me first start by clarifying that alligators are not native to Michigan, which is what made me so skeptical about believing this legend until I had an in-person encounter with him, the Michigan Gator Man. A little backstory on my family. We recently purchased a house in a small town in Michigan's Upper Thumb, Caseville, Michigan was a quiet beach town famously known for its cheeseburger festival. It seemed like a family-friendly town and a perfect place to spend summers. Everything was excellent the first year or so of living there, and then we began to hear whispers around town about the legend of what I was supposed to believe was the Gator Man. We figured it was some form of hazing that people did to new people in town and brushed it off. On the 4th of July, the town had fireworks, and about 12 of us decided to sit on the sand to view them. Our street had access to a private beach, so we were the only ones there that night. Everyone else was on the public side of the beach in the distance. My cousins and I were having a great time, actually, dancing to the music and just goofing off in general. 
then, we hear something coming towards us in the distance. It's a low growling sound. We stare, but we don't see much because it's very dark along the water. Either way, there's a big group of us, so we weren't too terribly threatened by it. At this point, the crickets stopped chirping, and any voices in the distance became muted. Even the waves of Lake Huron seemed to hush. It became dead silent. My cousin Kurt points toward a low growling sound, and he says that there were two yellow glowing eyes growing in size as something was coming towards us. The loud crash of fireworks pulled our attention away from whatever it was, and when we looked back, it was seemingly gone. We began watching the fireworks show and soon forgot all about it. Our attention is pulled away from the fireworks as sand flies over our heads from behind us. All of us whip our heads around to see it. A figure of a man stands in the dark. Only once the flash of fireworks illuminates him enough to see what he truly is. His skin seemed to glow in the light. He looked skinny, almost scaly. We couldn't get a great look at him because of our light source. It was flashing in and out, of course. The grand finale of the fireworks began and we glanced away for just a split second. And suddenly, a splash of the water happened. This weird man was gone. After the fireworks show ended, we all decided this was pretty creepy and didn't stay at the beach for much longer. I tried to rationalize how he looked in the light, and maybe just thought he had a nasty sunburn or some sort of, uh, I don't know, skin burns or something like that. The following day, we headed back to the beach to look for any evidence that could bring some sense to the situation, and just to be safe, we got our dog with us. What we found made our skin crawl. Leading from the sand to the water was what I could only describe as gator tracks. But here's the kicker. A piece of driftwood was floating in the water next to where the tracks led, and it looked to have some sort of odd scratches and bite marks on it. I moved to get a closer look, and my dog instantly began growling and refused to walk any closer. This made me uncomfortable enough to listen and to head back to the house as fast as possible and get as far away from these tracks as I could. That night, my cousin and I decided to go back to the beach for an evening swim, but mostly to look for the gator man. I now understand that this wasn't the brightest idea, but we were bored and wanted to figure this thing out. We reached the sand, using our phone flashlights to look for any sort of evidence, but we didn't find anything interesting, so we swam in the water. We were in the water until our cousin felt something brush up against her leg. As our initial shock was settling in, our eyes began adjusting to the dark water. We saw some air bubbles and immediately felt the tension in the air. A tall figure slowly emerges from the water in the moon's light. Those same yellow glowing eyes met mine for a not so appreciated second time. He was angry and we needed to leave this water. We knew immediately this was, this was his beach and he had the upper hand especially in the water. We booked it back to the house, never looking back to see if it was following us. I still can't visit that beach to this day. I still see those glowing yellow eyes when I close my own. I don't know what the Michigan Gator Man wants, but I feel sorry for those who find out. Mississippi Dog Man by... Pam M. Hey Swamp Dweller, my name is Pam. I live on the northeast corner of Mississippi, less than 10 miles from the Tennessee and Alabama state lines, and 70 miles from the infamous Taylor, Mississippi. My granddaughter, who is 11 years old, had an encounter with the cryptid a few months ago. Let me describe what happened and what she witnessed. Sometime around 11 p.m. we returned home from the county fair here in Alcorn County, Mississippi. My home is approximately six miles from town in a relatively rural area containing lakes, trees, and fields used for anything from tomatoes to soybeans and even cotton. My land is almost 20 acres. We have our home, a barn, a shed, and a lake about 200 yards from my house. The rest is trees and a few cleared out pieces. Anyway, back to Saturday night. My granddaughter, A, 
decided to walk outside to find her kitty before she went to bed. My husband and I were already in bed, and why she went out without waking one of us shocked me, but she didn't wake any of us up. She didn't even wake us up when she returned after seeing this thing. She did get in bed with us, and slept with us that night, and the next night. However, the following day, while fixing breakfast, she walked into the kitchen and said, Mama Pam, y'all have some kind of strange dog out there. I asked her what she was talking about, and here is her answer. When I went outside to find Kitty, I started walking to the front yard and saw something huge and white. I thought it was a dog, but when I got closer, it looked more like an old, bad, skinny grandpa. He was walking on his hands and legs, and then it got up on its back two legs. It looked around and it saw me, then it ran toward the barn. Mama Pam, I ain't never seen anything run that fast. I asked her if she had seen the face of this thing, but she told me that she did not. She didn't get to see it long enough to see any real features. She said it only looked toward her for just a few seconds, and it was too dark to make out any discernible facial features besides that it was bald. I know my eyes were as big as saucers. I knew what she had seen wasn't anything from around here. She told me it was very skinny and again bald, and it looked like it had trouble even walking on all fours, making it hard for her to believe that it could run so fast. She said on all fours it was jerky, but it wasn't like that when it was on just two legs. I told them I thought it was a crawler and could not believe she didn't come screaming for me and my husband to wake up. She said at the time, and in her 11 year old mind, she didn't consider it harmful because it was frail and seemed to have such a hard time walking. But she did say that when it took off toward the barn, it was a lightning fast. She said that's when she got nervous. She returned to bed with my husband and me when she saw how fast it actually was. I know she's telling me the truth because she's never been exposed to anything that would even remotely give her an idea for this story. Not to mention, she doesn't really lie to be honest, and she slept with me and my husband for the next few nights as well. She's really not a kid to make up things. She's down to earth, a cheerleader, a soccer player, a softball player, and an all-around, well-rounded kid. I hope somebody listening to this in the swamp can answer these following questions. Have any of you ever heard these creatures anywhere else around Mississippi, Tennessee, or the Alabama areas? She has a four-wheeler, a bicycle, and does a lot of outdoor activities. I'm scared to let her go do those now. Are we in danger? Thanks for sharing my story. Too afraid to go out outside by myself now as well. Something stalked our campsite. By M. J. Hello Swamp Dweller and anyone who may be listening to this. I am a long time listener, but this is the first story I have ever submitted. It has bothered and spooked me for almost a year now, and I would love any input that anyone has on it. Last year, around June, I was camping in the middle of nowhere Arkansas, with my boyfriend James and his friend Lane. We were generally having a good time, hanging by the creek, building a fire, and listening to groovy tunes. We continued to hang out into the night, and were all partaking in some drinking. This makes the next part of the story seem unbelievable, but trust me, it was just as incredible to us at the time, and we were there. We were all sitting around the fire, when James and Lane spotted a small fire off in the distance. This was strange since we hadn't noticed anyone camping nearby all day. We ignored it for a bit and continued having a good time until we all went to sleep around midnight. I remember waking up sometime a little bit later feeling immediately confused and frozen with fear. It was still dark. I turned to James who was already sitting up and listening intently. I heard sticks cracking just outside the tree line, just outside of the tent. I realized that there was either a person or some sort of creature walking around outside. Couldn't tell you if it was a bear or a wendigo or some sort of freaking spaghetti monster. All I know is that we sat up frozen in silence and unsure if we should be afraid or not. Suddenly I heard someone attempt to open my car door. It was locked. I heard two distinct pulls on the handle and then an urgent whispering. James and I froze. We thought it had to be people at this point and Lane was alone in his tent about 15 feet away. We sat waiting for whoever this was to leave, 
with bated breath. I was terrified because of what happened next. I swear, these voices, they sounded human, but the way they were going back and forth almost made them sound ethereal. This was, this was something weird. The whispers initially started with things like, this was a bust and these guys didn't have anything suitable to steal or something along those lines. Then, we heard a third voice come out of nowhere saying, maybe we check the tents. Frozen in fear again, we waited as long as we could, in full anxiety mode. My mind was relieved that I heard their heavy footsteps approaching the fire that we had seen earlier. Now you might be wondering why I'm sending this in under the cryptic category. Well, that's because in the morning, when we looked out to see if there was any sort of footprints or anything like that, there were none. No footprints, no feet prints, no shoe prints, nothing. Also, when I said that the voices sounded ethereal, it almost sounded like they were whispering right in our ears, but somehow we could hear them all the way across to where our car was. And on top of that, we did hear a lot of rumors about, you know, gnomes, fairies, trolls, all sorts of weird things that are said to roam these sorts of areas. So maybe it was something like that. Or maybe it was just a band of thieves who were incredibly light-footed. I couldn't tell you. What I can say is, though, we were all super freaked out, since those people, creatures, or whatever, could have severely hurt us if they wanted to. But we were relieved that they thought of our stuff as worthless or whatever. We decided we would not be camping anytime soon in that area, though. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange cryptid encounter horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button silly. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes and that helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. If you're new to the swamp, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications as I upload new episodes multiple times a week. I also live stream almost every single night reading live scary stories. Be sure to join me and don't miss out. I would love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. It helps me pick out better stories in the future, and it's nice to see your reviews. If you're on the go, but don't have YouTube Premium, and still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories wherever you go, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please be sure to give us a 5-star rating over there as it helps us grow on those platforms. I'll see you guys soon with a new creepy episode.